In the spring of 1846, Mexico and the United States went to war. This war dramatically changed the boundaries of North America and the destiny of the two nations. In this episode, we will cover the events that led to the start of the war, General Zachary Taylor's advance into the land disputed by the two nations, and the first clash between Mexican and American forces. When Mexico became independent from Spain in 1821, its boundaries were very different from what we know today. Mexico was a large country. However, most of its population was concentrated around Mexico City, leaving large areas of land unpopulated. In the first 10 years after its independence, Mexico authorized American immigration into Texas to make this remote province more productive. However, things started to get out of control for Mexico rapidly. American immigrants soon outnumbered the Mexican settlers. In 1835, Texans revolted against Mexico, and, on April 21, 1836, they defeated the Mexican army allowing Texas to become an independent country. The Republic of Texas was never recognized by Mexico, as it was considered a province in rebellion. As a result, the borders were never officially established between Mexico and the Republic of Texas. Nine years later, in late February 1845, in a joint session, the United States Congress voted to annex Texas. When news reached the Mexican ambassador to Washington, Juan Almonte declared the annexation to be an act of aggression, the most unjust which can be found recorded in the annals of modern history. Almonte immediately demanded his passports, thus severing diplomatic relations between Mexico and the United States. On March 3, 1845, American President John Tyler sent a formal offer to Texas for it to be admitted into the American Union as the 28th state. For John Tyler, this was his last full day in office. Next day, March 4, 1845, James Polk became the 11th American president. Polk was also in favor of annexing Texas and also acquiring, by any means, other Mexican territories like New Mexico and California. On July 4, 1845, a Texas convention debated the annexation offer and almost unanimously passed an ordinance assenting to it. The bill to annex Texas was signed by President Polk on December 29, 1845. The Republic of Texas formally joined the U.S. in February 1846 and became the state of Texas. Since 1844, General Zachary Taylor and his Army of Observation had been stationed at Fort Jessup, Louisiana, near the border with Texas. On May 28, 1845, knowing the formal annexation of Texas was about to be finalized, James Polk issued orders for General Taylor to get ready to march into Texas. Meanwhile in Mexico, in early June, 1845, Mexican President José Joaquín Herrera declared American actions in Texas to be an insult to Mexico's dignity as a sovereign nation, threatening her independence and political right to exist. He called upon citizens to defend their country. Herrera also mobilized the country's military forces in preparation for a fight. However, no declaration of war followed. A month later, on June 29, Taylor received the orders to march into Texas to a point close to the Rio Grande. As early as July 1, 1845, the Army of Observation started to move into Texas, Taylor decided to send most of his forces by sea. His orders were to occupy a spot on or near the Rio Grande and avoid any acts of aggression. Polk's goals were to put pressure on the Mexican government to re-establish relations, accept the Texas annexation, and secure the sale of New Mexico and California. In late July 1845, the first American troops arrived at the small town of Corpus Christi, in the mouth of the Nueces River, some 140 miles or 225 kilometers from Matamoros on the Rio Grande. They found no resistance from the small Mexican population. Once in Corpus Christi, Taylor renamed his forces Army of Occupation. After the arrival of the Army of Occupation in late July 1845, additional troops arrived at Corpus Christi over the following months. The number of American personnel grew from 1,500 to 4,000 men, 
The troops stationed in Corpus Christi began the task of organizing and training in battalion and brigade-sized formations. Regular soldiers and volunteers drilled and practiced marksmanship over and over. The Army of Occupation also prepared for the upcoming march by acquiring horses for the troops and mules to pull the numerous wagons required for the march to the Rio Grande. The initial Mexican reaction to Taylor's occupation of Corpus Christi was to gather an army in the city of San Luis Potosi in central Mexico, 430 miles or 690 kilometers away from Matamoros. The commander of this army was General Mariano Paredes, a conservative hardliner in favor of fighting the United States. Mexican President Herrera knew that Texas was lost, however, he would not publicly admit it as this would ensure a military revolt. Trying to avoid a war, Herrera accepted to negotiate with an American special envoy over the issue of Texas. Back in Mexico, in late 1845, the political situation was very tense. Some politicians supported the idea to go to war, while some others were willing to negotiate with the Americans. At the same time, rumors of a military coup against the Herrera administration were frequent. On December 6, 1845, American negotiator John Slidell arrived to Mexico. His official title was Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary implying that upon starting conversations with Mexican authorities, Mexico was accepting to restore diplomatic relations with the U.S., and at the same time accepting the Texas annexation. Slidell brought with him a long list of topics to discuss, not only the issue of Texas and its border. He also wanted to negotiate the Mexican debts to American creditors and the possible purchase of the New Mexico and California territories. President Herrera was willing to negotiate on Texas, possibly to tie an agreement about it to forgiveness of Mexican debts, but he was not willing to discuss surrendering additional territory. On December 14, 1845, alleging lack of supplies for his army, General Paredes rose in revolt against President Herrera. In reality the reason for the revolt was Herrera's willingness to negotiate with the United States. Instead of marching north to face the Americans, General Paredes marched on the Mexican capital. On December 30, unable to find support to resist the insurrection, President Herrera resigned. Paredes entered Mexico City on January 2, 1846 and on the following day, he was named President of Mexico by a junta of notables. In the meantime, Slidell was still waiting to be received by the new Mexican government. He kept James Polk updated on the situation in Mexico and the lack of success negotiating with Mexican authorities. On January 13, 1846, after the Mexican government did not show signs to negotiate with Slidell, James Polk sent to General Zachary Taylor the following instructions. Advance and occupy with the troops under your command, positions on or near the east bank of the Rio Grande. Polk thought this movement would force the Mexicans to sit at the negotiations table. General Taylor started to advance towards Matamoros on March 8, 1846. Before news of Taylor's advance reached Mexico City, on March 12, the Mexican Foreign Affairs Minister forwarded a message to John Slidell announcing that Paredes had decided no to negotiate with him. The message asserted Mexico's desire to avoid conflict and willingness to settle the issue of Texas peacefully but made clear that Paredes was not considering any surrender of territory. Knowing his mission had failed, Slidell requested his passport in mid-March 1846 and promptly returned to Veracruz ready to board a ship to New Orleans, and from there he traveled to Washington. In this part we will cover Zachary Taylor's advance to the Rio Grande. In early February 1846, following Polk's orders, General Taylor decided to move his army to the north shore of the Rio Grande, across from the Mexican city of Matamoros. In the previous months, American scouts explored the terrain around Corpus Christi. The information gathered assisted Taylor to decide the best route to get to Matamoros. On February 24, 1846, Taylor gave notice that a march was imminent, within the next two days. However, Taylor had not enough mules to move all the supplies and was forced to delay the departure of his army until he bought enough mules from Mexican ranchers.
On March 4, 1846, Major William Graham was sent ahead with a few dozen men to establish a supply depot about 50 miles, or 80 kilometers, from Corpus Christi, on the way to Matamoros. Four days later, on March 8, the Army of Occupation started to move out of Corpus Christi. The main units departed as follows. On March 8, Ringgold's Light Artillery Company and the 2nd Dragoons. On March 9, was the turn of General Worth's 1st Brigade. Next day, Colonel McIntosh's 2nd Brigade and James Duncan's Light Artillery. On March 11, Braxton Bragg's Light Artillery Battery, 3rd and 4th Infantries, under Colonel William Whistler. The same day, Taylor and his staff followed along with some 300 wagons with supplies. Some infantry troops, artillery, and additional supplies were sent by ship to Port Isabel. Port Isabel was located some 27 miles, or 43 kilometers from Matamoros, and was to be used as the main supply base for the Army of Occupation. For the most part, the march was uneventful and weather was favorable. Along the way, Mexican cavalrymen were spotted following the Army of Occupation while gathering intelligence on the size and destination of the American forces. Taylor expected to be confronted at Arroyo, Colorado, midway between Corpus Christi and Matamoros, as it was considered a good defensive position. However, General Mejia, the commander of the Mexican army in Matamoros, did not send his army to challenge the Americans. As the Army of Occupation was getting closer to Matamoros, General Francisco Mejia sent multiple urgent requests for reinforcements and additional supplies to the Mexican government. On March 21, 1846, the Army of Occupation's vanguard paused its march to allow the units on the rear to catch up. Next day, the rest of the Army of Occupation arrived at the waiting point south of Arroyo, Colorado. On March 23, the Army of Occupation continued its march as a single body. On the 24th, Taylor decided to secure his supply route and left to Port Isabel with seven companies of dragoons. General William J. Worth was left in command and was ordered to advance towards Matamoros until reaching a position about 14 miles, or 22 kilometers north of that town. A few hours before General Taylor reached Port Isabel, the transport ships, Porpoise, Lawrence, and Woodbury arrived with supplies and troops from Corpus Christi. Mexican officials protested the American presence and set the town ablaze. However, a quick American reaction saved most of the buildings from catching fire. After Port Isabel was secured, General Taylor departed to catch up with the main body of the army on March 26. Taylor left behind a few hundred men at Port Isabel, under the command of Major Monroe, to fortify and defend the supply depot. Taylor, with the additional artillery and supplies, rejoined the Army's main group on March 27. Later, the Army of Occupation continued its march towards the Rio Grande. On March 28, 1846, the Army of Occupation reached the Rio Grande, across from Matamoros. A camp was established and the American flag was raised to the astonishment of the Mexicans on the other side of the river. Meanwhile, in Matamoros, Mexican General Francisco Mejia, with only 2,000 men and about 20 cannons, did not react violently to the American presence across the river. Taylor informed Mejia that his presence in those lands was peaceful and had no intent to invade Mexico. General Mejia, knowing war would break out sooner or later, fortified his positions in Matamoros and placed artillery pieces in strong fortifications, where they could attack the American camp. At this point in time, a tense peace ensued. Taylor ordered the construction of a star-shaped earth fort facing Matamoros. Construction efforts started on April 6. This fort was initially known as Fort Texas, at a later date, the name was changed to Fort Brown. The fort could shelter around 500 men and several pieces of artillery. Soon after the arrival of the Army of Occupation, some of its soldiers started to cross the river and deserted, or joined the Mexican army. Many of these deserters later formed the St. Patrick's Battalion. Additionally, a number of American slaves were able to escape to the south side of the Rio Grande where they became free men, since Mexico had made slavery illegal since the late 1820s. The new Mexican president, Mariano Paredes, sent reinforcements to Matamoros. On April 11, General Pedro de Ampudia arrived with additional troops after a long and slow march plagued with discord and lack of proper supplies. At this point, the Mexican army in Matamoros consisted of approximately 6,200 men, 
Taylor's army of occupation numbered close to 4,000 men. Sources differ on these numbers as desertions were widespread, more commonly on the Mexican side. The next day, April 12, 1846, Ampudia sent a letter to Taylor, demanding the withdrawal of his army back to the Nueces River, or else. It will clearly result that arms, and arms alone, must decide the question. Taylor wrote back rejecting Ampudia's demands. On the 24th of April 1846, General Arista arrived and took command of the Mexican army. He informed Taylor of his arrival and his desire to conduct the upcoming war in a civilized manner, stating, At the very least we as generals should conduct that warfare with all the rules and courtesy expected of civilized nations. In late April 1846, tensions on both sides of the Rio Grande were at their highest point. General Taylor couldn't do much as he had orders not to commit any acts of aggression. On the Mexican side, preparations to attack the Army of Occupation had been hurried, and Arista, the new Mexican commander, was ready to cross the Rio Grande and expel the American invaders from the land he was convinced was part of Mexico. On April 24, 1846, General Taylor received reports that Mexican cavalry had crossed the Rio Grande to the west of Matamoros. On the evening of the same day, Taylor sent two groups of dragoons to investigate these rumors. These patrols were expected to report back by noon the next day. The first group, led by Captain Crow and Kerr, moved to the east of Fort Texas to investigate any Mexican movements directed to Point Isabel, they found nothing unusual and returned on time to report to Taylor. The second group was led by Captain Seth Thornton. He was in command of Company C and F of the 2nd Dragoons Regiment. They headed northwest of Fort Texas. His orders were to ride 27 miles or 44 kilometers and look for any signs of the Mexican army on the north side of the Rio Grande. Taylor also ordered Thornton to gather intelligence on the number of Mexican troops and the number of pieces of artillery. Captain Thornton's force was 56 men strong. However, other sources consulted mentioned the American patrol consisted of between 60 to 80 men. They departed from Fort Texas at around 9 p.m. Thornton and his men rode along the Rio Grande for part of the night. At some point, they stopped to rest for a few hours. Very early in the morning of the 25th, the American Dragoons resumed their patrol. At the same time, the Mexicans were moving their army to the north shore of the Rio Grande. General Anastasio Torre John, following orders from Arista, was crossing the Rio Grande near a point known as La Palangana. Torre John's 3rd Cavalry Brigade was approximately 1,600 men strong. Torrejon's orders were to move between Fort Texas and Point Isabel to force Taylor to fight on open ground. Along with Thornton's patrol was a Mexican guide known as Chipito. As the Americans marched along the road, Chipito and Thornton's interpreter questioned the Mexican habitants they found along the way. Later that morning, after talking with some Mexican ranchers, Chipito informed Thornton that the Mexican army had already crossed the river, and it was a mile and a half or 2.5 kilometers up the road. Chipito decided to go back to Fort Texas as he was wanted by the Mexicans. Thornton decided to continue with his patrol. Further down the road, a Mexican horseman was spotted riding away from the Rio Grande. Thornton ordered to chase him, but the mysterious rider escaped. The Americans continued their patrol, heading west. Nearing the completion of his assignment, Captain Thornton and his men entered a large field known as Rancho Carricitos. The field was surrounded by a thick chaparral fence on three sides. Along the south side of the field was the Rio Grande. Negligently, no one was ordered to stay behind to guard the single gate that gave access to Rancho Carricitos. At this point in time, the alertness of the American patrol relaxed. Most of the American dragoons took the opportunity to dismount and dispersed, some others took their horses to the river to get them water. Thornton was distracted interrogating the locals to determine whether they knew anything about the Mexican army's location.
Unbeknownst to the Americans, Torrijan arrived at Rancho Carecidos and with his large force, blocked the access gate. Torrijan also sent some of his men around the outer perimeter of the fence surrounding the field to attack the Americans through the fence and prevent anyone from escaping. When Thornton was made aware of the Mexican army's presence, he gathered as many troops as possible and ordered his men to charge, heading towards the narrow gate where the Mexicans were waiting for them. After a short exchange of fire, the Americans failed to break the Mexican line and were driven back with heavy losses. Thornton and some of his men went around the inner side of the field in an attempt to cross the chaparral fence, but were met with fire from Mexican units located on the other side. Thornton was wounded and fell off his horse, he was not spotted by the Mexicans that day, but was later captured trying to make his way back to Fort Texas. The commander of Company C, Captain William Hardy, and approximately 25 men, had withdrawn to the far end of the field and considered crossing the river. However, the shore was too boggy and was impassable. Hardy and his men had no other way to escape and were faced with only two options, fight or surrender. Hardy and his men decided to surrender as they had no real chances to escape. Hardy sent one of his men with a white flag towards the approaching Mexicans. A Mexican officer came forward and demanded that the Americans surrender. Hardy had no alternative and consented to surrender, on the condition that they had to be treated as prisoners of war. The Mexicans accepted these terms. The short skirmish, later known as the Thornton Affair, resulted in nine dead, two wounded and two missing Americans. The Mexican losses, if any, are unknown. The rest of the American survivors were taken prisoners and marched to Matamoros where they arrived on the 26th of April. Later, Tory John sent two wounded Americans to Fort Texas by cart, with a note informing the Americans that he lacked the proper medical facilities to care for the wounded soldiers. Late on April 26, Captain Hardy was allowed to send a report of the skirmish to Taylor. The next day, Thornton was brought to Matamoros and he also was allowed to send his own report. Taylor, after hearing the testimonies of Chipito, the returned wounded men, and reading the letters from Hardy and Thornton, determined that the ambush was carried by forces of the Mexican army, this was no accident or guerrilla attack. Taylor immediately sent a message to Washington stating, Hostilities may now be considered as commenced. At the same time, he sent messages to the governors of Texas and Louisiana, requesting reinforcements. Taylor's report reached Washington, D.C. on May 9, 1846. James Polk immediately urged the American Congress to declare war on Mexico. In his message, Polk controversially stated, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States, has invaded our territory and shed American blood upon American soil. Congress declared war on May 13th. The Mexican-American War had begun.